Welcome to Preparation for Practice Week. My name is James Piper, I'm one of the Clinical Teaching Fellows at the Royal Free. Uh, myself, Venetia and Daisy are the Clinical Teaching Fellows at the Royal Free who normally deliver this programme. Um, obviously, unfortunately, we can't be meeting in person, so we've done our best to put together the PFP Week um, as substituted online instead. So, welcome. This is the first case in four which you will have reviewed at your GP session today, albeit from a distance. So welcome to PFP from a distance. So again, we're sorry we can't be there to deliver this program together. Usually PFP is a highly interactive course, um, but unfortunately uh, we can't be together to do it. We would recommend that you try and follow the program on Moodle as the activity is sequenced. So, for example, we're going to follow on from my colleagues in general practice and review the four clinical cases in the hospital setting. Then this afternoon, you'll go on to review the uh, discharge summary and handover processes and so on. There will be opportunities for questions and answers, or you can email us directly at royalfreeteachingfellows at gmail.com or myself at james.piper at ucl.ac.uk. There is a YouTube channel for all of you, especially acute medicine students. Uh, this is something that I have created in order to facilitate the acute medicine teaching. Uh, my colleagues at the Whittington and the uh, UCLH are putting together their materials. Um, so regardless of which specialty, uh, sorry, which hospital you're working at, you are all very welcome to have a look. Uh, but obviously I'd appreciate any comments, likes and subscribes. So that's the link there, or you can search on YouTube, James, MBBS, UCL, Acute Teaching Fellow to find the videos, which will include topics such as fluids, oxygen, uh, chest x-rays, AKI, and so on. So for those of you, if you need a refresher on the ABCD assess assessment process, then I would suggest that you pause the video here. There is a link um, on Moodle under the Acute Medicine content to a Resource Council demonstration video of the A2E process, or you can follow that link here. So what are we going to do at this session? So you should be able to recognise sepsis and septic shock. You should also be able to list the steps in investigation and management of suspected sepsis. So you will have already have met Mr. Aaron Dreyer in your GP session. Uh, reminder, this is a 30 year old man admitted at night with a 24 hour or so generalized headache, fever and feeling non-specifically unwell. On admission, his observations were he had a patent airway, his saturations were 96% on room air, had a respiratory rate of 24, a heart rate of 112, which was regular, a blood pressure of 90 over 50, he was responsive to voice and had a temperature of 39. So the first task I've got for you is um, I've put up here for you the News 2 scoring system. I'd like you to pause the video here and calculate Aaron's News 2 score. So Aaron's News 2 score is 11. He has a respiratory rate of 24, which gives him 2, heart rate 2, blood pressure 3, responsive voice 3, uh, and temperature 39.0, which gives him a 1. Um, for a more detailed explanation of News 2, um, there is a tutorial which I've created called Principles in Acute Medicine, which does go through um, the aspects of the News 2 scoring system in more detail. So, another question for you, based on Mr. Dre's history, what is your initial impression? A. Anaphylaxis. B. Recreational stimulant drug use. C. Intracranial bleed. D, sepsis, or E, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Again, pause the video and think of the answer. So the answer is D. Let's, lo let's look at the others, though. So why can't it be anaphylaxis? Well, the first thing that excludes um, anaphylaxis is the fact that it's been going on for so long. Anaphylaxis, by definition, is a rapidly evolving progression of cardiovascular and immunological collapse. So the fact that he's had these symptoms for 24 hours goes against anaphylaxis entirely. Recreational stimulant drug use, well, particularly you may see um, hypertension, tachycardia, hypotension if you become dehydrated. So it's not impossible. And with some um, drugs such as methamphetamines and other stimulants, you may see um, hyperpyrexia such as ecstasy and so on. Although there's nothing in the history that suggests that's what's been done. 
Again, with intracranial bleed, you can see fever as a response to the intracranial bleed. You won't necessarily see hypotension. In fact, in significant bleeds, you get Cushing's response where you'd see hypertension and bradycardia. Uh, again, usually in significant intracranial bleeds, there's usually a, ma a severe index headache. Again, none of this is suggested in the, uh, Aaron's presentation. With neuroleptic malignant syndrome, again, there is no mention of him taking antidepressants in the history. Although, of course, I would say um, with regards to B and E, you particularly always should take a good drug history uh, and always ask about a good medication history as well. So ABCD assessment, as I said, his airway is patent, he has respiratory rate of 24, he has normal breath sounds, his saturations are 99% on 15 litres of oxygen via a non-rebreathed mask. He looks warm and dry, vasodilated and sweaty, which would account for his physiological findings of a heart rate of 112, blood pressure of 90 over 50 and normal heart sounds. He had a GCS of 14 over 15, although I would advise that you keep it to the News 2 score and simply see whether he's alert, confused, responsive to voice, pain, or therefore unconscious if none of the above. He had neck stiffness but no focal neurology. He had optic discs were not clearly seen due to photophobia. Now, why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant because... Um, if he had blurred optic discs, for example, this would suggest raised intracranial pressure and therefore we would avoid doing a lumbar puncture if that was the case. On examination or exposure, he had a soft and non-tender abdomen, a capillary blu blood glucose of 7.4 and no rash. So another question for you, which of the following is the most, sorry, single most appropriate next action? Think about your answer, pause the video now. So the answer is C. Which of the following is the single most appropriate first action? So first of all, let's go through the answer. So put out a cardiac arrest call. Well, there's no evidence that Aaron is in cardiac arrest. That said, with a new score of 11, it would be entirely appropriate to put out a medical emergency call. And in fact, this is something that I encourage my nursing staff to do uh, when we do simulation drills in acute medicine. So control the temperature with paracetamol. Well, it is important. Um, however, if we think about the ABCDE process, he has issues with C. Uh, temperature is generally considered an, part of the E assessment. Um, certainly you want to give fluid resuscitation and obtain IV access and get blood cultures, uh, which is why the answer is C. You may want to call a consultant microbiologist, although they're unlikely to offer anything at this stage apart from the standard uh, ABCD advice and to give antibiotics, which we would come on to shortly. It is likely that Aaron will have a CT scan of the head, but most importantly, he is tachycardic and hypotensive. And in our ABCDE approach, it's the C that needs treating at this time. What is the most likely diagnosis? Again, pause the video. Uh, I suspect by now you'll have an answer. And the answer is E, meningitis. So let's quickly go through the others. So why can't it be pneumonia? Well, there are no focal chest sounds um, and no evidence to suggest that he's particularly hypoxic. He's not had any urine symptoms, which again goes with urosepsis. Encephalitis, it could be, although encephalitis is rarer. Um, there's no overt travel history. And also it's important to realize that although Aaron is only responsive to voice due to the lack of cerebral perfusion, he is not acutely confused. And usually with encephalitis, you see um, uh, behavioral changes and confusion. Although severe influenza is possible, um, or certainly COVID, it doesn't usually cause um, sepsis in the same way that meningitis does. Uh, so the answer is E, meningitis. So what is meningitis? It's inflammation of the meninges or the outer membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. It's caused by infection with viruses, bacteria and other microorganisms. Uh, or meningitis can be caused by non-infective causes such as a paraneoplastic phenomenon, autoimmune and injury. Although these causes are relatively rare, it's always important to consider your overall clinical picture and history. 
we would recommend that all cases of suspected meningitis should be managed as though having bacterial meningitis until proven otherwise. Meningococcal uh, meningitis can uh, evolve very rapidly into septic shock and cardiac arrest if not managed quickly. It is fair to say, however, that bacterial meningitis is most common in babies and children, although, again, we do see flare-up in university-aged children, sorry, adults, I should say. That was a Freudian slip, I promise. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain tissue itself and is relatively rare, but, again, would be considered in those in which you are concerned about behavioural change or confusion. So what are the common causative organisms in the UK? So the most common ones are Neisseria meningitidis, which would cause meningococcal uh, meningitis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which would cause pneumococcal meningitis, Haemophilus influenza type B or Hib. Viral causes include enteroviruses such as Coxsackie or Echovirus, and also herpes viruses such as HSV type 1, HSV type 2 and varicella zoster virus. Certainly with uh, HSV type 2 you'd be more concerned about encephalitis. I have seen one or two uh, cases of um, mumps meningitis in my career lifetime. This tends to be due to incomplete vaccinations. HIV meningitis, uh, we have a relatively large HIV workload in London, although rare, should certainly be considered in those who don't have uh, any up-to-date HIV tests and also um, where there is concern about risk factors for the disease. Certainly we would advocate that taking an HIV test in anyone who has uh, s concern about meningitis or any other infectious disease. So next question for you, so which is the single best group of investigations that you would do? A. Sputum culture, blood culture. B. Throat swab, urine culture, blood cultures. C. Blood cultures, CT head and LP. D. MRI head, LP and throat swab. E. Chest x-ray, sputum culture and urine culture. Again, pause the video while you decide your answer. So the answer is C. Let's go through uh, the other answers though. So sputum culture would be useful if we were concerned about respiratory infection. Uh, throat swab, again, the yield is questionable. He doesn't have any obvious throat symptoms, so we are unlikely to get anything diagnostically useful. And out of the other um, investigations, such as um, those outlined in C, throat swab would be of less importance. Certainly if you are, were concerned about quinsy or tonsil abscess, viral throat infections, then a throat swab would be useful in that context. He has no urinary symptoms, so urine, urine culture is unlikely to be of any yield. Unlike the elderly, younger people tend to feel uh, the symptoms of urinary tract infection unlike the, old, unlike the older patient. So the answer is C. So blood cultures, uh, CT head and lumbar puncture. An MRI head may be considered as part of the inpatient investigations. However, MRI heads uh, cannot be tamed um, as an emergency, uh, especially out of hours. It's uh, not technically doable. Therefore, a CT head would be much more useful at this time. The main question when we are asking for a CT really is rather than any intracerebral findings uh, such as abscess or space occupying lesion, and although unfortunately we do see those from time to time, the main question is whether there's any contraindication to performing a lumbar puncture. An LP is the critical diagnostic test, and the others I've already explained. So what is the first line treatment you would give? Again, pause the video, review the antibiotics and decide. So the answer is A, IV keftriaxone, two, two grams stat and then twice a day. IV acyclovir you would can consider, however, that's a tiny dose of IV acyclovir. Um, the answer would be 10 milligrams per kilo. IV flucloxacillin is too narrow and is commonly used in uh, infections such as cellulitis. IV kermoxiclav, although a good antibiotic for GI and respiratory infections, does not have enough CNS penetration to be of use uh, in the context of CNS infection and is not used. 
IM benzyl penicillin is uh, where what the GPs might consider administering in the community but we certainly don't give uh, IM antibiotics uh, in an emergency in the hospital setting. If the patient is pregnant or greater than 55 years old or immunocompromised we would add amoxicillin as we would be concerned about atypical infections such as listeria. Patients on the whole are relatively um, unlikely to be uh, have beta lactam allergy where you would use chloramphenicol instead. So meningococcal disease, this is uh, meningitis or septicemia caused by an Arsiria meningitidis. It is a gram-negative diplococcus, which is a common bacterial commensal of the nasopharynx, hence the possible utility of doing a throat swab. It most commonly presents as bacterial meningitis, 15% septicemia, 25% or of the combination of the two, uh, which is 60%, which does uh, remind you of how why uh, treating meningococcal sepsis urgently, rapidly uh, and will often need ICU care. As you can see, these patients will be sick very quickly indeed. As you can see, this is a wine glass test here to see if it's a non-blanching rash. So this is a diagram of, um, of how you take a lumbar puncture. We have put in a lumbar puncture workbook for you to work through. This will be a particular interest to senior students and this is available under the acute medicine section of Moodle. And this workbook has been uh, drafted with thanks to uh, Dr. Nick Merch, one of the acute medicine consultants here at the Royal Free. So once you have taken your CSF samples, uh, this table here outlines the particular findings that you might see in bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis, tuberculous meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So sepsis is defined as by the Third International Consensus Definitions Task Force, which met in 2016, is described as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Basically, the bottom line here is to always consider sepsis. And so we've sort of freed ourselves of the narrow definitions such as SIRS plus source of infection in order for us to think more widely about the possible possibility of that the patient has sepsis. So when we think about uh, more frail patients, patients with um, autoimmune diseases who are along long-term immunosuppression, they may not present in the typical fashion that we have thought about. And that's why the sepsis definition as it stands is a more wider definition uh, to try and catch more patients. So septic shock, septic sepsis, which is associated with profound circulatory, cellular and metabolic abnormalities with a greater risk of mortality than sepsis alone. So clinically, how might we see this in the emergency room or in ICU? These are patients that have a vasopressor requirement. Uh, vasopressors are medications which basically squeeze the blood vessels and increase your systemic vascular resistance and this is to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65. Uh, also a serum lactate level of greater than 2 millimoles per litre in the absence of hypovolemia. It's important to note that this combination is associated with hospital mortality rates of greater than 40% and these patients will all need ICU care as vasopressors cannot be administered outside of the ICU and critical care setting. Up here is the um, previously used um, surge response, um, which is no longer used in sepsis terminology. Um, basically, it represents a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, but you might think about, actually we'll see this uh, type of phenomenon in things like pancreatitis, burns, and major trauma. Therefore, it's not specific enough to sepsis. It is often an appropriate reaction to infection, but as I said, it does activate other inflammation and can be um, from other sources and it's not particularly useful for separate, separating patients who will do badly from those who will do well. We've moved on now to what we describe as QSOFA. So this is a screening test used to identify patients with suspected infection who are at greater risk for a poor outcome. So altered mental state gives you a score of 1, respiratory rate of uh, or greater than 22 gives you a score of 1 or so, and a systolic blood pressure of less than or equal to 100 milligrams of mercury gives you a score of 1. 
So a Q-SOFA score of two or more suggests a high risk of poor outcome in those patients with suspected infection. These patients should be more thoroughly assessed for evidence of organ dysfunction and where the sepsis may be coming from. An important strategy in sepsis is, of course, source control, i.e. your patient isn't going to get better if you still have an appendiceal abscess still there or a perforated uh, paracolic abscess. So, another question for you. What constitutes the sepsis 6? A. Oxygen, blood culture, arterial blood gas, IV antibiotics, fluid and catheter. B. Oxygen, bloods, ECG, oral antibiotics, catheter and paracetamol. C. Oxygen, blood culture, ABG, oral antibiotics, IM adrenaline and paracetamol. D. Blood culture, ABG, ECG, oral antibiotics, fluid and paracetamol. E. Oxygen, bloods, ECG, IV antibiotics, fluid and paracetamol. Pause the video here while you review these answers and then decide. So the answer is A. So let's review some of the others. So ECG can be quite useful or is no, not particularly determinative uh, and will rarely change the management in a septic patient. Oral antibiotics would be inappropriate in those who have sepsis, certainly for at least for the first 24-48 hours, a uh, IV antibiotics is essential. Paracetamol, again, although while useful and is a very potent antipyretic, um, it is not um, the most important things that we should be doing in managing patients with sepsis and does nothing for sepsis control. IM adrenaline is not a treatment in sepsis. Um, I am adrenaline is the treatment primarily for anaphylaxis, which is so therefore, which is a very different pathophysiology to sepsis. It may be that we give the patients IV adrenaline um, in the critical care unit um, as a vasopressor. The patients that will receive IV adrenaline via a central line are often extremely poorly. Certainly in my time as an ICU registrar, we would very reluctantly use IV adrenaline because it causes profound hypertension and tachycardia. So an ABG might be useful um, if there are no particular respiratory symptoms and the patient's not in any oxygen, it would be perfectly appropriate to do a VBG or venous blood gas as opposed to an arterial one. Um, for those of you that have done ABGs or seen them done, you'll note that they are quite painful. We'll be discussing ABGs and showing you a practical demonstration video later on in the week. So here is the septic six, high flow oxygen via a non rebreather mask. Fluid challenge, which is 500 ml of crystalloid fluid up to a maximum of fif over 15 minutes. Um, I've done a tutorial on fluids um, in the, my series called Acute Medicine Shorts, which you are, again you are very welcome to look at, which goes over fluid prescription in a bit more detail. Uh, board spectrum, IV antibiotics, uh, such as tazacin, uh, blood cultures, uh, arterial or venous blood gas, depending on whether the patient's on any oxygen or not, to do a lactate measure, and a fluid input and output chart, plus or minus a catheter. Uh, all of these patients, particularly if they are frail, will get catheterized, because uh, you need to be able to able to measure their urine output, which, would be, which should be a minimum of 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. So in summary, sepsis is an abnormal host response due to an infection. It can cause abnormal physiology, metabolic processes, and of course, most dangerous is septic shock. Sepsis is a medical emergency, and all patients who are admitted on the acute take, you should have a high index of suspicion for the, for the uh, sepsis condition. And remember to do the sepsis six rapidly. So hopefully now you should be able to think about what sepsis means and what septic shock is, list the steps, and some of the investigations and management of presumed sepsis. Thank you for listening. Case two will follow next. If you have any questions, as I said at the beginning, you're very welcome to email us or contact myself. There will also be a Q&A session later on in the week.